Writing about crime contains themes and subjects that some may find upsetting. Listener discretion is advised. After five years of waiting for justice, the family and friends of Elizabeth LaFantasy hear about the torture and brutal treatment of their beloved Mamere before her death. And it's intolerable pain all over again. Autopsy photos and reports presented as evidence with grisly details that one cannot shake off easily are presented. Nothing good can come from a case like this. Yet Elizabeth La Fantasy leaves behind her a large family and generations that remember fondly their mamere. And we will too. So please don't leave me. Elizabeth LaFantasy was born on June 21st, 1937 in Manitoba, Canada. The family was large with seven girls and one boy. She married Arthur in 1954 and they had four children together and 20 years later they separated. During that period she spent a lot of time at home taking care of her children. Two were ill with cystic fibrosis and one of her daughters, Francie, passed away at 14 years old in 1975 from her illness. Anna, Lise, and Mitch would go on to have nine grandchildren who all called her Mamere. Elizabeth was a striking lady in her youth and into her senior years. She maintained her beautiful appearance and her gorgeous smile. She was always dressed up nicely and took pride in her personal appearance. Her real known strength, though, was taking care of everyone else. She enjoyed cleaning and caring for people and was a whiz in the kitchen. And she had a reputation for making the best cinnamon rolls and delicious homemade meat pies. Elizabeth was very involved with her family. She was there helping to take care of everyone and be involved in their lives. The only thing she cherished as much as her family was her faith. Elizabeth found strength and confidence in her routines of reading her Bible and reciting her rosary every day. She attended a pilgrimage and mass for the sick every year in Croatia, and it's said that when she returned, she was glowing with inspiration. She was inspiring to people around her, too. She had a loud, infectious laugh and would hug people so hard that sometimes they would say it was too tight. Elizabeth was also a hard worker outside of her home. She had a career working at the St. Amant Center in Winnipeg. And when she retired in 2005, she still focused on working. Having had two hip surgeries didn't slow her down. She was always busy and active. She was always involved in church activities and helping her children and her grandchildren. There were tough times as the families grew, but Elizabeth kept on track and jumped in to help. Her age didn't slow her down. Her part-time employment involves her love for cleaning. Her family joked about her being a clean freak, but she enjoyed it. And at 73, Elizabeth LaFantasy was healthy and busy and happy. Her family loved her very much, and it seemed like everything in the family was centered around their mamere. On February 17th in 2011, Elizabeth's daughter Lees called to let her know that because of bad weather, she wasn't going to chance coming into the city that Thursday for supper. Elizabeth had taken a roast out for the occasion, but she was quick to agree that going on the highway at night during the blowing snow wasn't a good idea. So the next day, Elizabeth headed over to Diane Wrightmere's apartment on Yorkwood Drive just after 8 a.m. to do her regular cleaning work. The last time she had been seen there was around 10.30 that day, and she'd been working for Diane for six months, and usually finished up around 1 o'clock in the afternoon. That weekend in Winnipeg was the Festival de Voyageur. Events scheduled for the Louis Brial long weekend. A lot of people were out and about, but it was a freezing cold weekend 
right in the middle of February, one of the coldest months of the year in Manitoba. The following Monday, February 21st, Deborah Sask finds a purse in the stairwell of the Summerland parking garage. Its contents are scattered, but there's no cash in the purse, and she finds a piece of paper that appears as a contact sheet. And so Deborah attempts to contact people that are in the entries, but she isn't able to get a hold of anyone, so she opts to take the purse to the police. She brings in the purse, and as officers attend to the area, more items are found discarded in the parkade. So, Winnipeg police sends more officers to search the entire building. And by that Wednesday, Elizabeth's daughter Lees gets a call from the police. They inquire if she knows Elizabeth, and she tells them that yes, Elizabeth is her mother. They inform her of the discarded purse and tell her that it was found and turned in. They tell her that according to one of the neighbors, her mother's newspapers had not been brought in since the Friday edition, and the neighbor thought that it was unusual, but perhaps she'd gone away for the weekend. So he stashed them away for her and was keeping an eye out. The officer requested that Lees come to the station and file a missing persons report. That way they could begin an official investigation into where she was. Lees begins the process and she begins calling her siblings and anyone else that may know where her mother is or give any idea of the last time that she was seen. She called hospitals in the city, fearing that her mother had suffered a medical emergency. And without her purse or identification, they could be searching for her family. By midday, the news was plastering Elizabeth's photo and description all over local media. Something was not right. That was for certain. One of the most concerning things for Elise was that her mother's pocket rosary was one of the discarded items that she identified from the parkade. There was no possible way that her mother would have left it behind. And if she had the ability to grab it, she would have done so. It was an unsettling detail for those that knew Elizabeth. By Thursday, the family was distraught and upset. Yet there was no doubt that police were doing everything possible to locate Elizabeth. Homicide investigator James G. Jewell recalls in his online miniseries, The Killing of Kindness, the Elizabeth LaFantasy murder investigation, on his blog, The Police Insider. News from Behind the Badge, which I will link in the notes. It's a miniseries where I discovered a lot of the details involved in Elizabeth's case. He describes when an extensive search was done and how much work was going into the case. The immediate tasks involved checking Elizabeth's banking records and searching for areas that may have caught any evidence on video surveillance, canvassing neighbors, and questioning the family about her habits. CSI was searching 77 University Crescent as a potential crime scene and all of the other intensive routines, such as crime analysis, identifying and ruling out parolees and sex offenders in the area, and establishing a victim profile. There was also a review of the data obtained from Elizabeth's parking pass. It was a thorough investigation. Investigators canvassed more than 1,000 suites at several apartment buildings and at the seniors' residence where Elizabeth lived and a high-rise in the Fort Gary neighborhood where her purse was located. Even an electronic billboard is posted on Pemina Highway near Bishop Grandin Boulevard, featuring Elizabeth's image and description. That day, a family member contacted Anna around 5 p.m. to tell her that on her way home from work in the area of Osborne Village, she came into an area that was surrounded by police cars and taped off to the public. Behind the barrier was a vehicle that looked to her similar to Elizabeth's, and Anna asked her to please go out and confirm that the license plate was hers. When her cousin called back, she told the family that the plates did belong to Elizabeth's car. There was relief that the vehicle was found quickly, 
but it turned into worry as the car was located. But where was Elizabeth? It was minutes after the family had found out that Elizabeth's car was located that officers arrived at the door, and one came forward through the entrance as Lees let them in, and he told her that the car was found, and his face told her the news was bad. He appeared devastated as he reached out to Lees, and he held her as she sobbed. Everyone else joined at the entranceway and held on to one another with tears and sobbing. They held on to one another, while Lise's daughter Charmaine stood looking on at her mom and auntie, crying. Although she was heartbroken herself, she couldn't help but feel pain for them. She later claims in a family blog about Elizabeth's life that it was difficult to see all of this heartbreak, because she felt so much empathy for them, saying, That's their mom. After discovering Elizabeth's vehicle on Lewis Street in the Osborne Village neighborhood, her body was discovered in the trunk, and her remains were taken to the Health Sciences Center to thaw for an autopsy. More details were gathered and brought to the lead investigators as information began to flow. It was becoming increasingly likely that a high-risk sex offender may have been involved in Elizabeth's murder. Even though it was early in the case, once it became known that her undergarments had been removed and the front of her pants had been torn from the zipper down to the knee, the motivation of the crime seemed to come into focus. She had been wrapped in a blue tarp and had heavy bruising on her wrists, forearms, and the side of her face. It appeared that she had been bitten on the left ear and some undetermined liquid had been poured over her lower body. Evidence pointed to a struggle occurring in the rear seat of her car, and it appeared that the door handles had been carefully wiped down and the car was sprayed clean with a pressure washer. As the family and community were coming to grips with the reality that Elizabeth had been the victim of a homicide, only investigators were aware of the grisly case details surrounding it. Elizabeth's homicide was not adding up to a simple blitz attack in attempts to rob her. The $75 that the investigators knew she'd been given for her cleaning job that day was missing. But as information funneled down, it was beginning to look like a sexually motivated homicide. An early suspect in the initial investigation was Luigi DeAngelis, a known high-risk sex offender who was in the area of Osborne Village at the Osborne Street Hotel during the weekend that Elizabeth had gone missing. That placed him in the area of where her car was discovered. He already had two previous convictions for sexual assault in the same area, and in the revelation about sexual motivations, that put him in the middle of the line of interest. As February 24th was falling into late evening, more clues were coming in. Three cigarette butts had been taken into evidence from the scene at 77 University Crescent. They were studio brand cigarettes. Although a popular brand, it was an important detail. And the lead detective also observed a plastic one liter container of 10W30 oil. He surmised that this was the undetermined liquid that had been poured over the lower part of Elizabeth's body. And it became important then to find out what brand of cigarettes Luigi usually smoked. They would need to contact him and have him ruled out or not, quickly. And in the meanwhile, investigators also discovered Elizabeth used an access card to enter and exit the parking garage at her building. The only activity on the day she was last seen was at 7.53 a.m. when she exited to go to work. On February 26th, officers confirmed that Luigi DeAngelis did in fact smoke studio brand cigarettes. Not nearly enough evidence to prove anything, but it was falling in line with some thinking that was predominant at the time. Awaiting the results of the autopsy was a sticking point. The time it takes for thawing to occur and have suitable conditions for testing is a waiting game. 
Not a terrible situation though, as it's a good way to preserve minuscule evidence like DNA. The lead investigator was waiting for any new information from the submitted evidence, and things took a turn when a palm print was discovered on a scattered piece of paper located in the stairwell at the Summerland Suites where Elizabeth's purse was found. That print was a match to a known offender in the city, and his name was not Luigi. The offender's name that matched the palm print was Thomas Anthony Brine, a known criminal offender with two outstanding arrest warrants and an additional DNA warrant. He was already flagged for an interview regarding two unrelated incidents, a robbery and a theft investigation. And after reviewing Brian's criminal record, it was apparent that he fell into the category of habitual property offender with a number of convictions over a five-year period that included 15 counts of theft over $5,000, breaching court orders five times, escaping lawful custody, dangerous driving, break and enter including theft, possession of stolen goods twice, possession of a stolen vehicle, and his last two charges were pending. Three counts of assault causing bodily harm, assault, and two charges of possession of stolen goods. It was notable that Thomas Bryan had been criminally active for over five years and that only recently did his charges involve a violent crime. Things were coming together. As homicide investigator James G. Jewell discusses in his observations about the case, it was perplexing. But police experience and logic dictates that offenders like Brian rarely make the leap from petty thefts to sexually motivated homicide of elderly women. So was Thomas Brian the offender for certain? Jewel questioned certain evidence, such as officers finding glove impressions on Elizabeth's vehicle. If he was wearing gloves, how do you explain his prints on a document at the crime scene. And the location of the crime was also at issue. 77 University Crescent was a location where several petty thefts, stolen vehicles, and break-ins did occur, and those all fit Thomas Bryan's profile. It had to be considered that Thomas happened upon the purse after the crime was already committed, and since he's a habitual offender, he would likely go through a bag he finds in a garage for anything valuable and toss it. His prints could tie him to the event, but only superficially at this point. By February 29th, prints are found and confirmed to be Thomas's on papers that were sent in for testing, and they were found inside of Elizabeth's vehicle. Now, it's time to move in on Thomas and have an interview. So that Monday, the search for Thomas begins, and in the afternoon, he's located at his girlfriend's apartment. The papers are submitted to obtain a warrant, and police are ready to go and search the apartment where Thomas was staying with his girlfriend. The officers get a lucky break when Thomas makes an excursion out of the suite in the early morning. So without the warrant, they were able to snatch him up and bring him in for questioning, because he was already wanted in respect to other offenses. Detective Sergeant Wes Rommel and his partner, Detective William Bill Keller, were running the interview with Thomas Bryan. Their combined experience and expertise didn't leave Thomas much of an opportunity to play games. He would have to have clear reasons for his prints being in the vehicle and on the piece of paper from the purse. It wasn't too much of a leap to assume that he would explain away his prints being found under certain conditions, so the detectives were careful they didn't give him any more details of where they found the prints. The interview was long, and Thomas assumed that his prints were found in or on the vehicle. Fantastic, because now he was in a corner to offer how likely it was that he discovered the purse after he found the car. He was trying to angle in the direction that he had discovered the car running and had no idea when he stole it that it was the vehicle 
that had been involved in a crime. As he's pressed, he continues on with silly storytime antics. He says, I'm not a fucking psychotic. How the fuck am I supposed to know, man? What I know is I jumped in that fucking car running. Some fucking idiot left that car running, man, like I do every fucking day. I'll tell you every single car, every single fucking car I ever broke into my whole entire fucking life and go down for them, but I'm not going to jail for a murder that I never did. All right. Thomas was kept in custody on the existing warrants, and in the meantime, officers received a new warrant in respect to his residence. Inside, they found Thomas's backpack, and it contained Elizabeth's car keys. The idea of him keeping the keys gave lead homicide detective Jewel a chill of familiarity. Like other serious offenders, he was possibly keeping a trophy. Detectives had also discovered earlier that day videotaped footage of Brian in Elizabeth's vehicle at an Osborne Street car wash a few blocks from the street where the vehicle was discovered parked. The recording was dated Friday, February 18th, and the timestamp showed Brian entering the car wash at 5.53 p.m. and exiting at 6.04 p.m. Thomas opens up and says the vehicle was left running in the parkade on Admar Road, just off Pamina Highway. So he stole it and took it to the Summerland Parkade, and that was where he discovered there was a body in the trunk of the vehicle. He panicked and began doing crack cocaine while driving to the car wash. He claimed he was so paranoid that he would be blamed for the body in the trunk that he wanted to wash all traces of himself off the car. He told them, I sprayed everywhere I could think of, the door handles and inside the doors. He admits that he ditched the car shortly after in a nearby area and threw the keys into the snow. After that, he bought some more drugs and took them back to his partner's suite on Henderson Highway. And at that point, Thomas offers to take them to where he threw the keys. So they escort him to an area at the intersection of Donald Street and Stradbrook Avenue by the Winnipeg Squash and Racquet Club. He tells them the keys were disposed somewhere near the garbage bins, but after searching they couldn't be located, so he insisted that the snow must be covering up the keys. He wasn't aware that officers already had possession of the vehicle, and the keys were discovered at an apartment where he was staying with his current girlfriend. After he returns with the officers to the police station, the interview continues for hours. Later in the discussion, he's confronted with the information that they have the vehicle and they've searched his residence. And when confronted by detectives who clearly don't believe him, they say there's no boogeyman that put her in that trunk. He denied any knowledge of the murder and asked for a lawyer, refusing to answer any more questions not aware that senior Crown Attorney Brian Bell had already authorized charges of first-degree murder earlier that day. So Thomas Brian is charged 10 days after the murder of Elizabeth Le Fantasy, and on March 1st of that 2011, police announced to the public that he's charged with first-degree murder, and by the 4th of March, the autopsy is performed Shortly after that, a warrant is executed for Thomas Bryan to supply his DNA. Things progress slowly to a trial date. On April 8th of 2013, the case proceeds to a preliminary hearing held at the Manitoba Law Courts. There are shenanigans on Thomas's side as he fires his attorney and considers defending himself in court at trial. Things kind of move forward at a slower pace, and during this entire time, the grisly details are not fully known to the public or the family. Only investigators and legal professionals involved in the case know how repugnant the gruesome Thomas's actions are. Sexually motivated homicide 
on an elderly lady in her 70s is especially grievous. There are not much details available in terms of Thomas's life experience. Details of his crimes, though, do tell us some things that are important to consider and what is known about this type of offender. Elizabeth's murder was a random event, suggesting the killing was not planned or premeditated, and under the Criminal Code in Canada, a homicide committed in the course of confining a person is considered first-degree murder. This fellow had a long history of escalating crimes, but to predict this jump is reasonable? I took a look, and I was less comfortable after what I discovered in the research. This kind of assault or murder is quite different than what we would put under the umbrella of elder abuse. We're talking about a stranger-on-stranger -stranger criminal act, and we know that in Thomas Bryan's case, he was most likely looking for money and transportation to give him access to what he really wanted, drugs. It seems unusual for this event to take on the added risk involved in a sexual assault. Even the police found the leap from petty theft to break and enter and robbery into a few assault charges very normal. But the bridge to a sexually motivated homicide of a senior citizen is not logical. And reviews of sexual assaults committed against the elderly are not plentiful. The findings in a Canadian review, The Sexual Assault of Older Women, Criminal Justice Responses in Canada, were that social science suggests older women are most likely to be sexually assaulted by someone they know, and that a disproportionate number of sexual assaults against older women take place within care facilities. However, the case in law in Canada is not in line with those observations. Most reported cases involve women attacked at home during a robbery. I have to stress, these numbers are difficult to understand because many sexual assaults that occur in the home of an elderly female, by a family member, a caregiver, or someone known to the victim, likely will not end up as a criminal charge because it's less likely to be reported. And if it is... It will likely be screened out by adult care services and police rather than going to court as a criminal case. Those things are not relevant in Elizabeth's case, but it does explain the very shocking disconnect between the courts and social science. So looking at reviews of stranger sexual assaults against older women you'll find that they tend to involve younger perpetrators between 16 and 30 years of age. Oftentimes, they already have a history of sexual assault, but it's usually involving children. And it demonstrates that the assault is more about the vulnerability of their victim than their age. And as you'd probably expect, most times, alcohol and or drugs are involved and it amps up a robbery into a sexual assault. And unfortunately, it ended in homicide in Elizabeth's case. Further research suggests that these types of assaults are likely to be particularly more brutal and anger-motivated than cases when a younger woman is attacked. And in a review, The Sexual Assault of Older Women, by Dr. Nathan L. Pollock at the Clark Institute of Psychiatry, these assaults generally had indications of a need for power or a sadistic intent, and just deeper, gratuitous violence is involved. Dr. Pollock noted, It also appears there are more psychotic features and psychological processes in men that sexually assault older victims. I think we could have determined this from gut feelings, but it's good to know that the research agrees with our repulsion. Court of Queen's Benz judge, Joan McKelvey, heard the case, and it was argued by Crown Attorneys Brian Bell and Crown Nancy Fazenda. Defense counsel for Thomas was Bruce Bonney, a familiar and respected defense attorney 
that has worked several challenging cases here in Manitoba. And the jury was comprised of nine men and three women. The family and friends of Elizabeth LaFantasy filled the courtroom to support each other, and they were wearing badges with Elizabeth's photo. Thomas's mother attended trial regularly. She was said to be deep in anguish. Thomas's father attended to support his son, but was clear to express his regrets to Elizabeth's family. The charge was first-degree murder, with the sentence and a guilty verdict being a mandatory life in prison, with no chance of parole for 25 years. Although, in her opening statement, Nancy Fazenda agreed that the homicide didn't appear premeditated. If a person is killed in the process of a robbery or in confinement, it is deemed first-degree murder. The Crown established that Thomas had admitted to officers he regularly broke into vehicles parked in the underground parkades of that area. In the interrogation with detectives, he was asked why he was in the south end of the city, and he responded, I'll be honest with you, I go there to break into cars. He was around the parkade on University Crescent around the same time that Elizabeth was, because she was attending to a suite that belonged to a client that she regularly cleaned for. The Crown established that he accessed the parkade when someone else drove in, providing a recording of him stating, I sneak in with a car and I go through the cars. I'm usually messed up when I do that shit. I don't feel anything. Thomas was foggy about the details, but he placed himself in the two parkades. He proposed Elizabeth's car was running when he encountered it. I guess they were about to leave. I just jumped into it and took off. To his knowledge, he did not encounter anyone or see anyone else around in the parkade during the time that he stole the vehicle. During trial, evidence and testimony presented included the chief of medical examiner. He expressed the injuries as a broken leg, facial bruising, sexual assault, and the cause of death was a black and white scarf that was used to strangle her. The Crown called a pathologist that was the DNA expert at trial, and the expert testified that the DNA that matched Thomas was on and in Elizabeth's body and had one in a 68 trillion chance of not being his. The DNA evidence made the case for the Crown. Semen found inside the victim proved the accused did not just grab a running vehicle that happened to have a murdered elderly lady in the trunk. As those grisly details were read out, Thomas Bryan never once showed any expression, but the details were new to the family, and they were hearing them for the first time. Daughters, granddaughters, and friends were finding out the particulars during trial, and five years after the event. Focus moved on to details given by a forensics officer. They testified that Elizabeth's car was cleaned in a car wash on Osborne Street, called the River City Car Wash, and later on the same day of her murder. Thomas Bryan was clearly viewed on the security footage for approximately 15 minutes, and after the car wash, the vehicle was abandoned on nearby Lewis Street. The Crown argued that the brutal actions are not those of someone so intoxicated that they don't have awareness of what they're doing. A regular user of crack cocaine, they put forth that likely he was in the parkade to rummage through vehicles, and he became violent when he was caught in the act. They argued that Thomas meant to cause her harm and likely knew it would cause her death. He also had the cognition to know that he wanted to remove all evidence of himself being in the vehicle. He only tailored his explanations as he was made aware of what evidence detectives had possession of. Bruce Bonney, the defense argued that someone else was responsible for Elizabeth's death. Thomas had denied knowing about it and later admitted to knowing that the body was in the trunk. A long time interrogation on him may have changed his claims and created a false confession. 
He asserted that Thomas found the car running after the real killer had abandoned it after placing Elizabeth in the trunk. It was then suggested that if Thomas had masturbated that day, he could have transferred DNA over to her and when he discovered the body in the trunk. Even though the semen had been discovered in and not only on the body, the defense raised issue with the forensic expert's notes. He asserted that something may have mixed up, putting forth that the notes and DNA labeling were sloppy and messy and negligent. He also argued that the notes and exhibit numbers were added after the fact during his cross-examination. He also put forward that it was too risky for Thomas to take someone dead or alive in the trunk and drive around the city in a stolen vehicle, stating that other explanations and suspects are out there. Once the jury was sent to deliberate, they were only in discussions for three hours. And on February 17th, that 2016, the verdict was read aloud. Thomas is convicted of first degree murder and he'll be given an automatic sentence of life with no parole for 25 years. It's the steepest in Canada. People on both sides of the courtroom were crying, and Thomas sat silently and stoic, looking straight ahead. His mother sobbed, shouting, Thomas, I love you, as he was removed from the courtroom. It was, you had a knot in your stomach, and you just you hold it in. You know, we couldn't really say anything there, but yeah, it was relief, relief. Were you surprised at the only two and a half hours of deliberations? Maybe not even that? We weren't, yeah, we're, so we thought maybe it might go a little bit longer, but yeah, it was total. Even into the evening, we were prepared. We, we didn't know, we know that they had a hard task, and yeah. uh, they did a... A good job at, at what they decided and uh, we're happy and, and we know it doesn't bring our mother back. The pain is still there and it might be there for a long time yet. At least we're rest assured that this can't happen to somebody else by this man. Yeah, we'll no, never we'll know never why. know why. We, we, we are afraid for anybody now that is living in a block that has an underground parking. It could have happened to anyone. It happened to our mother. Can't see why. I think whoever has their moms today or their grandmothers, hug them, embrace them and be with them because you just never know. Sentencing took place the next day, Thursday, February 18th, the fifth anniversary of Elizabeth's murder. Her daughter, Lise Goslin, said in her impact statement that her mother was healthy and happy at the time of the murder, and that her expectation was to lead a long life into her 90s as her parents had before her. She said, it's hard to accept what's happened to our loving mother, but we are forced to continue to find a way to live with it. She expressed that her mother was always there for the family, including her two daughters that suffered with cystic fibrosis, one who passed away at a young age and another that required a double lung transplant. Thomas was 29 that day and he'll be released in February of 2036 at the age of 54 years old if he's granted parole. At the time of his conviction, the only mitigation available to Thomas Bryan in the Canadian Criminal Code was something referred to as the Faint Hope Clause. It's a statutory provision that was arranged for convicts with a sentence over 15 years that were not granted an earlier parole than their life sentence. The Faint Hope Clause is no longer available for any offenses committed after December 2, 2011. So technically, Thomas Bryan could apply for this relief, but it's unlikely that he would be considered, and even if granted, he would still then have to go through the parole procedures to be considered for release. This clause was introduced to provide some incentive for dangerous inmates who view themselves as having nothing to lose, so to speak. And it would lower the risk to prison guards dealing with dangerous inmates that may cause more violence because of their perceived situation. In the end, it was not considered effective. First, there was a repeal for offenders that committed multiple murders after serial killer Clifford Olson applied for early parole under the statute 
and later it became clear that the process was more likely to result in the re-traumatization of victims' families and increased public perception that corrections is too soft on the most dangerous offenders. Outside of the Manitoba law courts, granddaughter Charmaine Gosselin said, it's disgusting. It's sad, it's horrible, all the time. Five years was difficult to wait for a verdict because it's like waiting so long and ending right back where it happened again. I don't think we'll ever know the answer to why, and we've been prepared for that. Shortly after Elizabeth's trial, prosecutor Brian Bell ended his 26-year career with the Crown's office by retiring. Brian was the original Crown prosecutor that got Mark Edward Grant convicted in the Candace Dirksen case. I discussed her tragic case earlier, and on appeal, Mark Edward Grant's case was overturned, unfortunately. Brian had a successful career with the Crown's office in Manitoba. His string of successes included lobbying for one of the longest sentences in Manitoba history that didn't involve a murder. In the Michael Shearnick case, he was the lead prosecutor in the Weeb killing, a memorable case where a young man was lured by four conspiring offenders and murdered in 2003. Another intense trial in Manitoba that Brian Bell was involved in was the Jerome Labossier trial. After Jerome organized and planned the murder of his brother and his elderly parents in St. Leon, Manitoba in 2005, he had a strong reputation for keeping complex prosecution presentations very simple and succinct, and he was known to keep an even composure during emotional and high-stress trials. He told the Winnipeg Free Press before his retirement that it's not about me. I have a pretty simple job, and that is to present the best evidence. Thank you so much for joining me for this chapter 20 of Writing About Crime. I want to say thank you to Miranda Jem from Canada and Miss Lucy Lou 22 from Canada for leaving such nice reviews for me on iTunes. I really appreciate that so much. Oh, your comments kind of set the bar pretty high for me though. I also want to thank Gina K from Calgary, Alberta and Terry S. They're contributing a lot on the Facebook group that we have and uh, I really appreciate their comments. There's a few other people as well, Jen T and Heather Sim as well as Anna W are all really encouraging and interacting a lot with us on social media. So thank you. We do have the Facebook group and uh, I'm on Twitter and Instagram. So the links for those are all in the notes. Terry, thank you again for joining my Patreon. You can find a link for the Patreon in the notes as well. Until next time, I hope you'll check out these two podcasts. One is Murder in the Rain. That's a podcast centered around true crime in the Pacific Northwest as well as one called Apple for the Teacher. It's about true crime that happens in schools. Until then, take care. Calling all true crime fans, murderinos, crime junkies, and wine coven members. Have you listened to Murder in the Rain yet? Murder in the Rain is a true crime podcast based in the Pacific Northwest, focused on the local cases that make us the notorious home of bizarre crimes and serial killers. I'm your host, Alicia Holland. And I'm your host, Emily Rowney. I'm Josh. I forgot. I forgot. I was. In each episode, we will cover a case to bring you all the details of the crime. We often feature interviews with people close to the cases, including authors, victims, doctors, and detectives. Most content is dark and not suitable for young or sensitive listeners, but we do try to lighten the mood by providing a blooper reel at the end of every single episode. Trust me, you'll love it. Check us out today, and if you like us, don't forget to subscribe, follow us on social media, and leave us a review. Our website, MurderInTheRain.com, has additional content, podcast feeds, discount codes to some of our sponsors, and an interactive map with locations for each episode. Hello, everyone. Let me tell you about the Apple for the Teacher podcast. I'm Anna Thomas, a teacher and your host. 
So you're probably thinking it's about reading, writing and arithmetic, right? Well, think again. It's a fresh take on true crime, where you wouldn't expect to find true crime. In schools, yes, schools, you will hear tragic and shocking stories that I have uncovered in my own profession. You'll hear about murder, abduction, hijack, misconduct, student disappearance, suicide, kidnap and ransom, and much, much more. So if you're looking for something a little different in the true crime genre, an apple for the teacher is for you. You can find the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you download your podcasts. So join me as I present People Behaving Badly, The Bad Apples. Looking forward to seeing you soon. But until then, remember to be a good apple.